Okay, um, so it's great to be here. I'm just back from, uh, just back from uh, Munich, uh, where the European Conference on Computer Vision was uh, during the whole week. Um, and um, what I'll do is I'll open up a little bit what's inside HoloLens. Uh, so HoloLens is one of those mixed reality devices. Um, here's an example. You could try it out earlier uh, during the demo sessions. Uh, so this is a product Microsoft brought out two years ago. Uh, in the meanwhile, of course, we've been working very hard on the next generation. Um, I can't say much more about that, but I'll give a few hints during the presentation. Um, but before we get there, um, there's a few things I want to say. So essentially, in terms of uh, devices with built-in computer vision, um, or devices where we have challenges of really pushing what we can do with computer vision to the limit, um, these devices are uh, really probably the, the, the you know, one of the furthest out examples. Um, in particular, um, like Margarita was saying, it's actually very challenging when you have to do a lot of perception with a very small um, compute budgets with very limited resources. So on a drone, you are limited. Still, a drone actually, when it flies, consumes maybe 100 watts just to stay in the air. Um, and so if your compute takes 10, 20, 30 watts, it's all fine. Uh, on a device like this, the whole device in this form factor you know, probably has to stay below 10 watts, including the displays, including the rendering, including everything, um, uh, just because it cannot dissipate more power. Not because the batteries are too small, just because it cannot dissipate more power without heating up the device. Um, for a device like this, it needs to continuously sense the environment. So you cannot do a mixed reality device. Contrary to your phone, when you have your phone and you're looking at some static information, it just stays static. You don't have to do any computations. You can actually freeze even the GPU potentially and just keep a, a, a fixed frame. On a mixed reality device, as we'll see in a second, if you place an object, you want to virtually place an object in the world, um, and you want then to have that object give the impression that that object is part of the world. To do that, what we are doing is on each eye, we are rendering an image on the left eye that corresponds to exactly what I should see from this viewpoint for seeing that object. And then for the right eye, I also have to render exactly what I should see from my right eye position. Meaning that if I just turn my head, I already need to re-render those images continuously. On top of that, I don't only need to do that, I need to do that with no latency, almost no latency. So I need to do that, I need to do that super fast. Uh, I think it's the right one. Ah. No, no, it's headphones. Oh, it should be good. Okay, so, um, so let me now show you a small, short, one-minute video um, where, uh, to give you an idea of what HoloLens uh, is supposed to do, uh, what the purpose is, uh, and all the applications. And then after that, I lift the veil on what we are doing behind the scene, essentially, to make it possible. Microsoft HoloLens brings holograms into your real world. Using transparent lenses, spatial sound, and an understanding of your environment, holograms look and sound like they're actually part of the world around you. That is mixed reality. With Microsoft HoloLens, holograms are viewed through the holographic frame centered in the middle of your view. This preserves your peripheral vision so you can move freely and connect and collaborate with the people around you. Holograms in mixed reality don't block out what you can see and hear. This enables you to engage with digital content and tools alongside the objects in your real world. Holograms can be world-locked in a physical location, so you can walk around them, or they can travel with you. You can even hear them in 3D with spatial sound. Microsoft HoloLens is the world's first fully untethered, self-contained holographic computer. With the mixed reality experience of HoloLens, you can stay in the real world and interact with real people as you simultaneously explore 3D in 3D. OK, so let me now open up uh, HoloLens and show you a little bit what's inside. So just to make this possible, we need um, a whole number of sensors. So we have also here these four environment cameras, um, and then uh, which are used to see what happens in the environment. So this is where we use visual odometry or inertial visual odometry by combining it with inertial sensors. 
Uh, think of it very much as what we do with our own eyes and how we sense our own motion through, through space. Uh, we're essentially combining our eyes, both a central st uh, stereoscopic vision together with peripheral monocular vision, um, together uh, with our uh, inner ear um, ac acceleration uh, sensing. Or, um, so we're essentially using very similar um, sensors for that here. Um, then there's also a depth camera, uh, which is used then to more understand in detail the environment, and we'll see uh, why, why that is needed or what that enables. Um, in a sense, the whole goal here is to put a lot of technology behind the scene to enable a completely natural and intuitive interaction uh, with the real world, with the 3D world, and with information that we now place in the 3D world. Um, in particular, something very simple, um, the way that you, know, with a, you interact with a computer is typically with a mouse, and then you move a cursor over the screen. Or on a touch device, you move your, your finger. Here in HoloLens, the way you interact with the world is just by looking around. And as you look around and you look at something, uh, it will actually have uh, a cursor in the middle of your field of view. Now, that looks very simple. Um, and normally, if you only looked with one eye, you just had to put a cursor in the center of the view. But if you look with two eyes and you put a cursor in the middle of both views, that cursor looks actually like it's really far away. Actually, the intersection of two parallel lines, will, they will never intersect. It will look like it's an infinitely far away object. So just to be able to show the cursor, you, actu you actually have to have an idea of how far what I'm looking at is located in the world so that I can actually converge this cursor at the right place so that it, it looks like it's actually going over the surface uh, in the world. So that just gives you some idea of what has to happen in the background to be able to, to generate the right imagery. Uh, also, as we are um, rendering images here on the display, so here you see the displays, uh, as you're rendering images on these, on these uh, waveguides, which essentially take the image from here and then move it in front of your eyes so that it overlays on the real world, um, to render it at the right place, you need to know instantaneously at what, uh, what to, ren you know, to render this. But of course, even with NVIDIA or other graphics cards, you actually need a little bit of time to render. By the time you render it, it's already too late. You have already moved your head. So we have to predict forward to predict where you will be by the time the image is showing up on, on your image. Of course, we, do, we try to get the time as short as possible, but still, you need a forward prediction. Um, anything that would go above 10 milliseconds or something in delay would actually start making you feel like the world is actually your the things you augment in the world would be floating. Um, so, uh, so it's really important to hide that latency. So you need to predict forward, and you need to do a number of tricks to then further hide all this latency. Uh, and so I don't have time to go into details there, but HoloLens is essentially a fully self-contained computer. So we don't need a pack or anything else. Everything is on the head. All the processing is there. Uh, and this, of course, is very challenging. Um, in addition to a normal essentially equivalent to a mobile phone processor, uh, which you see there, you actually have something that we call the HPU. This is both for doing all of this real-time computer vision very, very efficiently um, by having uh, some specific optimizations there. In particular, our next generation, which we have announced last year, actually has also DNN capabilities built in the chip so that we can, at very low power, do inference on our raw uh, imaging streams. Uh, notice also that all the imaging streams here are going into this HPU, and then from the HPU, actually only the results of the computations go out. So in a sense, we also do the computations close to the sensors, but there's another reason for that. It's also a privacy reason. These are sensors that are always on. We need to sense all the time just to be able to provide you with the experience that HoloLens provides. But of course, it's not okay to have applications look at all this data. So essentially, these are isolated in the HPU. It gets computed there, and only results that are fine for privacy, only the results go out to the, to the applications and um, applications can work with. OK, so let me now very quickly go through a few of the, um, of the things that we have to do to make this possible. So on the one hand, this visual inertial odometry, so just think of your own motion through space, the motion of the HoloLens through space. Um, on one hand, also knowing when we revisit a space, knowing realizing we revisit the space so that the elements that we had placed in the world, we can retrieve them and recuperate them. Uh, and then also understanding what's around us. Uh, so here's very similar to some of the other talks. We're tracking features in those images. Again, remember, this is on a fraction of a watt that we have to do this. Um, we are tracking this. The middle images actually immediately give us an, an, 
a scaled representation of the world. The other ones are mostly used for robustness so that a head-worn device, you can very quickly turn your head. If you do that, you might lose track of, of your map. Uh, and here, this way, you can actually have a very robust system with those four cameras. Um, it's actually also what we then leverage also for uh, more virtual. Mixed reality is a continuum going all the way from virtual reality to augmented reality. Um, with our mixed reality device, we could actually leverage exactly the same technology uh, just with a few cameras in those VR glasses. They, they actually don't need external sensors to compute your motion. Uh, then in terms of finding back your location, conceptually, you could look at it like this. Let's say I'm walking around with a HoloLens. Uh, these are our offices uh, in Seattle. Uh, and I map a part of the building. Um, as I said, HoloLens essentially needs to do the mapping just as a way to work in the environment. Um, then let's say someone else works uh, through another part of the building, and then a third person works somewhere else, etc. Eventually, you can puzzle all those maps together. Um, so this is something that towards the future becomes possible where you can build cloud maps. But there again, there are privacy issues. We have to think through how we kind of make these things without uh, there's always a little bit of image data associated to all of those points. It's not directly image data. It's not directly invertible. Still, you cannot exclude that there are privacy concerns with this. Um, so you can build up. But of course, there's also a lot of value in this. These maps, they provide you with a way to then share information. Pl I place information in the world. If I can only see the information I place myself, it's quickly going to become a boring experience. However, if we're in a situation where many people Everybody that goes in the same space can share information with other people. It becomes much more valuable. Think of uh, your computer for those old enough, your computer pre-internet. You know, you could do things and maybe you bought a game and you could play it on, on your computer, but it was, you couldn't do that much on your computer. As soon as you could place things on the internet and others could uh, get access to that and, and you get, could access what everybody else put on the, internet, on the internet, it gets much more exciting. Same thing is going to happen in mixed reality. But the canvas is now not the World Wide Web, but the canvas is the world itself, the 3D world. Uh, so here's an example of a video just of about 100 different sequences captured with HoloLens by just walking around, all automatically merged into a big map of the whole building here. Um, now, moving on to uh, the depth perception, uh, Microsoft has worked on its own depth technology. There was first, of course, Kinect. Uh, the first ver generation of Kinect, which is now what you find in Apple phones, uh, but then Microsoft decided to focus on time-of-flight technology and has really pushed the state-of-the-art in that space. Here you see the sensor in the current generation HoloLens. So you see both a depth image, the color indicates, uh, different colors indicate different depths, and on the right, at the same time as a byproduct, you get an image in the infrared domain um, uh, that, that corresponds to it. So essentially, HoloLens has like a flashlight that illuminates in the infrared domain, does something special with the light, and is able to compute the depth from that, uh, essentially by measuring the distance of how long it takes to come back and forth. OK. Uh, this can then be used to fuse that information um, over time to get then a more complete building. Here you see essentially the output. You don't see this when you walk with HoloLens, but this is happening in the background. Again, so that the cursor is at the right depth, so that if you place elements in the scene, they are occluded or not occluded, etc. All of the natural things can be done by leveraging this type of um, spatial mapping. Uh, here's then what you have in the background. If you have a larger space, uh, you can actually build up these very useful uh, things just in the, that come just as a byproduct of using the device in that space. What you see on the right is then if we combine that with our DNN capabilities of uh, understanding semantic elements of the scene, um, here's a very simple example, just a, a demo essentially of uh, doing semantic labeling of the surfaces that we see. At the same time as we reconstruct our 3D um, spatial map of the environment, we are also coloring it with different uh, categories. So as you can probably recognize, uh, light gray here, is for screens, red is for walls, blue is for ground, etc. Um, and here's actually other work, very similar. A uh, lot of work in my lab over the last five years trying to merge geometric and semantic reconstructions, doing it together and getting much better results. Same exact geometric information in, in the technique, but when we also combine it with semantics, we get much better results. Um, that was at ETH, of course, uh, in that case. Um, the, um, so the other question, beyond sensing the environment, there's also a lot of sensing the user. Um, this is what you see currently in HoloLens uh, in terms of tracking hands. It just detects when you click and when you uh, bloom to bring up. Uh, it's like the home button. It brings back the main menu. 
Um, but last year at CVPR, the main conference in computer vision, uh, we showed in Harry Shum's keynote, um, we showed essentially this, uh, this, this demo so here. So on the far left uh, is a result from a ResNet 18 that's showing you uh, hand segmentation right and left. And you can see it's doing that in real time. We're running that actually on our AI coprocessor. Um, and then the middle one is showing hand part segmentation, uh, 16 classes, again being done in real time, um, showing fingertips, uh, palm, thumb, all that. And then on the right is our uh, fully articulated hand tracking uh, that's, uh, that's going in real time as well. Um, OK, so you see all of this was essentially run from, from the whole lens up there. Um, then why, why do we want to do this? Now, of course, five, 10 years from now, we imagine we'll all have something of, about this form factor, which will do all of this. Um, and there will be plenty of different applications for it. Exactly like now with a, with a mobile phone, um, we have dozens of applications, each of us, that we use every day uh, for, for interacting with digital information in the context of the real world. Um, things will get even more natural here. However, the question is, what can we do today? What are the things that are already ripe to really bring value today? Why should somebody invest today in this type of technology? And so the first one is really when people in a commercial setting or in an enterprise setting need to do complicated tasks out in the real world. OK, so you're in the real world. You have to repair a machine or your surgeon, and you have to you know, do a surgical procedure, a complicated surgical procedure. At the same time, you need to access and see the preoperative scan. Okay? It's very similar. Repairing a machine, you need to see the CAT model of you know, how the machine should work and at the same time work with your hands and maybe you know, query additional information or see the, the information from, uh, from the, uh, the repair logs, etc. That's a super valuable scenario. And so I'll show that in a second. The other one is for 3D designers, for people that generate 3D information, there's also a lot of value there just to be able to communicate between the designer, between the people that make this 3D data, and then people um, that need to make decisions based on these designs that might not be as familiar with manipulating 3D information. Uh, even if you see a 3D model on a screen or even a 3D screen, because you are not yourself immersed in the same space, it can be very confusing. If you put on a HoloLens and the person you're discussing with also puts on a HoloLens, you can actually discuss the design, point at things. It's in your world. As you move yourself and you're used to interpret the 3D world, you can use you know, your own neural network that's been trained for your whole life to interpret the 3D world in front of you. You can leverage exactly that to learn and, and to understand the 3D design that's been put in front of you through the HoloLens. And you can discuss it with other people. Uh, so let me just show a very brief example of what the you can scenario do the we first have developed scenario. is really about dispatching a service technician using HoloLens in very different kind of ways. So as soon as the technician puts on his HoloLens, he already sees, I have a call here, I need to go to this elevator, and then actually sees a 3D picture of the elevator that he's going to work on, and that he can zoom into a part that will offer you also training opportunities. He goes to the job site prepared, probably better prepared than ever before, because he has the relevant data available to him in the best format possible, and in a variety of ways he can tailor the data towards his need. The technician putting on his HoloLens, looking at the elevator, sees the historical notes first, so what has actually happened with this elevator before, he already has all the information right there without having to look for it. It saves a lot of time and a lot of stress and effort. He gets information on his virtual desktop about the task orders he has to carry out. The latest safety alerts for that elevator. He pulls on a 3D a replication of that part, pulls it out in an exploded view, and can actually see which part is making the problem. A major advantage of the HoloLens, of course, is that we are hands-free, and we never had that experience and the capability before. In the past, the technician needed both of his hands to operate the laptop, and now he just has his HoloLens on. One of the most important capabilities we see with HoloLens is that we can trigger a remote call to a subject matter expert. Call Heather. Hey Jeff, how you doing? I'm uh, replacing a doorboard out here, but I kind of want you to check a couple things out. Okay, let me take a look. The JP3 is in the right position and your motor leaves are disconnected, so you're good to go. It takes a lot of stress out, it saves a lot of time, and our field test... 
Okay, so you see there is essentially a huge gain of efficiency and of, of uh, lower cost in repairing or lower risk of having a machine, somebody go to the site and they not be able to repair it and so on. So here you get the expert to help out. Um, so then, very quickly, um, this is actually our next generation depth sensor. We announced it uh, a few months ago. Um, this will be built in the next generation HoloLens. Uh, it, it's essentially the evolution uh, from, um, uh, from what was used in, in, uh, in Kinect. Uh, and so at the same time as building it into HoloLens, uh, we will actually also provide it as an ambient intelligence sensor. So as a sensor that sends depths in addition to normal imagery that can be placed in the environment and do scenarios uh, essentially of this type that can help you understand what is going on in the scenario in spaces of interest. Um, and then very briefly, just to make the link between all of these technologies that we're baking in into um, um, into these mixed reality devices, they're actually all essentially the same technologies that are used for robotics. Um, uh, here are some examples of um, you know, the first fully self-flying drone. We actually did work together with Margarita at the time, and then in this case, this was even a step further of actually being able to fly and map obstacles and so sort of fly at low altitude between buildings, uh, also again fully autonomously, um, and many other examples uh, in that space. Um, and similarly here, other robotic examples, uh, tying it also to the example of NVIDIA, of robots here, uh, a project with Bosch where the robot navigates through the garden and eventually will have a robot arm that helps cut your hedges in addition to cutting the grass. Um, and they also need to map out the garden, figure out what is the desired state of the garden, and then the robot can go back and keep cutting so that it stays like this. Uh, but a lot of intelligence needs to be baked in uh, and a combination of classical and uh, deep learning techniques uh, for really getting the, the desired uh, results. And sorry I went a little bit of time, uh, but here we are. <laughs>